Hello and welcome to the second part of lesson 13. In the previous part of this lesson, we made formal definitions of the first and second normal stress difference. We saw that the first normal stress difference can be thought of as an additional tension along the flow streamlines, and that the second normal stress difference can be thought of as compression along vortex lines perpendicular to those streamlines. Since normal stress differences have a significant impact on flow behaviour, we need to be able to measure them. So that's what we're going to discuss in this part of lesson 13. We will see that the first normal stress difference can be relatively easily measured, but the second normal stress difference is somewhat more challenging to quantify. So let's start by reminding ourselves of some definitions of the normal stress differences and also of some aspects of rotational rheometry. So what we found in the last part of this lesson was that we can define two normal stress differences. In the previous lesson, however, we phrased these normal stress differences as normal stress coefficients, psi, big capital psi. And psi 1, to remind you, is my first normal stress difference n1 divided by my shear rate magnitude squared, gamma dot squared. And so psi 1 is tau 1 1 minus tau 2 2 over gamma dot squared. My second normal stress coefficient psi 2 is n2, my second normal stress difference, divided by gamma dot squared. So that's tau 2 2 minus tau 3 3 over gamma dot squared. Now, normal stress coefficients are material properties, just in the way that viscosity is a material property. So, as you might expect, if they're material properties, we should be able to measure them. And indeed, we can with rheometry. But a little bit of care is needed, because what is perhaps not obvious at first sight, is a relative magnitude of these two different quantities. Psi 1 is a lot greater than Psi 2. So we will see in a minute that we can measure Psi 1, hence N1, relatively straightforwardly. However, measuring N2 is quite difficult because usually, there are some exceptions, usually we can't isolate N2 from N1. So we have to try and pick out N2 from N1. And of course, in the real world where you've got measurement noise and you may have measurement error, this becomes quite hard just due to the fact that N2 is a lot smaller. So let's think first about measuring the first normal stress difference, N1, consequently Psi1. And we can do this using a cone and plate tool. Now, if you think back to the lessons on rheometry, we've met the cone and plate before. And the nice thing that we said about the cone and plate was that the shear rate is constant everywhere. Now let's remind ourselves of why that's the case. In this particular example, I'm going to rotate the upper cone and keep the lower plate stationary. So a flow field is going to be set up in this rotational direction. And what we need to think about is how the shear rate develops as a result of that rotation. The key to this analysis, if you recall, was that this cone angle is very, very small, a matter of a degree or so. And so if we think about what that means for us, we can think about my shear rate as being the difference in velocity over a distance. So in this case, the velocity difference is vertically on this board. My velocity at a radius r is simply r omega. And remember, that is going in the rotational direction. So my angular velocity, omega, is the angular velocity with which I'm rotating that upper plate. And the circumferential direction velocity, v circumference, is just simply r omega. Now, at a radius r, I need to work out what the height is between that lower plate and the bit of the cone that happens to be at that radius r. And that's going to be r tan theta. Now, if we write gamma dot is r omega over r tan theta. Firstly, the radial terms cancel out, which is rather nice. And secondly, we can remember that for small values of theta, tan theta is approximately equal to theta. So my shear rate in this geometry is simply omega over theta, and it's constant. So that has quite an important effect for us, because if my shear rates are constant, then all my shear stress is a constant. If we think about the definition of my normal stress coefficients, psi, they also have a shear rate dependency built into them. It's n1 over gamma dot squared, 
So again, if gamma dot, my shear rate is constant, psi will be constant everywhere. So this is good. If psi is constant everywhere, that means tau 1, 1 and tau 2, 2 are constant everywhere. So the Conan plate is an ideal tool to measure things in because of this constant shear rate and constant stress that's imposed on the fluid. Now, if we think about the Conan plate tool, and if we think about what happens when we rotate this upper plate, hopefully now we can start to build a mental model of what's going on. If we think back to the last part of this lesson, we looked at flow strangulation, the Queller effect. And we saw that the Queller effect bunched fluid into the middle of that rotational flow in a way we didn't quite expect. But we explained that by saying, look, you've got tension in these streamlines. It's a little bit like surface tension on the outside of a bubble. The tighter the surface tension, the tighter the radius of curvature, the higher the pressure within the bubble. And the pressure within the bubble is higher than the pressure in the outside world. And likewise, in this particular application, you've got these streamlines kind of strangulating this fluid and trying to push it into the middle, which for our cone and plate means it's trying to push the lower plate down. So the Queller effect will act to push the plate down. What we want to try and do is to keep the gap between the tip of the cone and the base of the plate constant. So we need to push up with a force F. And it's that force F that we measure when we're taking normal stress difference measurements. Now, there's quite a elegant analysis that's detailed in Morrison and that you may be doing part of at some point that allows us to derive a very simple relationship between N1 and F. N1 is simply 2F over pi r squared. That means consequently that psi1 is 2F over pi r squared gamma dot squared. And so we've got a very, very neat way to back out results for my first normal stress difference simply by measuring that axial force I have to apply to that lower plate to keep the gap constant between the tip of the cone and the base of the plate. Now, if you do happen to be in a scenario where you need to derive this result, let me give you a few hints on how to go about that. So the first hint is that you're going to use spherical polar coordinates, which might seem a little bit odd at first, but when we think about it, it makes absolute perfect sense. In our spherical polar coordinate system, we've got two angular directions. We've got a, an angular direction around our axis of rotation, which we'll examine in a second, but we've also got an angle of direction in the azimuthal direction. So this is, in effect, our deflection down from the vertical plane. And so if we think of theta as being the direction of deflection from that vertical plane, we can see that that plate at the bottom is simply a surface of our sphere at theta equals pi by 2, or 90 degrees. We can also see that the base of the cone is a shape that you get when the deflection in that angular direction is pi over 2 less the cone angle. And so spherical polar coordinates describe the geometry of a cone and plate very, very well. If we think about the rotation, the cone is rotating around its axis, and that is in the other angular direction of spherical polar coordinates. We're going to call this the phi direction, and the cone velocity is rotating with v phi. OK. The third direction in our spherical polar coordinate system is radial, and we can see that is our distance out from our rotation axis. So the first thing we're going to do when deriving n1 equals 2f over pi r squared is use spherical polar coordinates. The second simplification that we can apply to this is to assume that the only velocity is in that phi direction. We're not assuming that there's any secondary flow or anything of that nature. Indeed, if there was secondary flow, this analysis wouldn't be valid. So the only velocity we've got is the phi direction, and we're going to ignore inertia effects, which for these experiments, especially given the viscosities or the apparent viscosities of these fluids, is a very, very good approximation indeed. Viscous force is going to be far higher. Now, when we think about using the equations of motion, we're only going to use the R component of the equation of motion. Because if we think about how V phi, that rotational velocity changes, it changes with radius. V equals R omega. So in the middle of our geometry at R equals zero, effectively there's no velocity. And at the edge, 
we've got v phi is omega times the plate radius big R. OK, so our R component of the equation of motion is the only one we're going to examine. And a really important simplifying assumption is based on the fact that my stresses are constant everywhere, which means that their derivatives are zero. And when you look at the equations of motion, there's a lot of stress derivatives. And if you can justify ignoring those because they're zero, the analysis becomes very much straightforward. So we can use a cone and plate tool to isolate my first normal stress difference, N1. You can imagine that we can probably get some data from parallel plates as well, and indeed we can. But what we find is that we end up with a combination of N1 and N2. We're not going to go through that analysis and how we get to the result. We'll simply detail the result here. But just to remind you what's going on in terms of our geometry, we've got two parallel plates with a constant gap. And we're going to rotate the upper plate. And again, due to that queller effect or that flow strangulation, the flow is going to try and push that lower plate down. But what we want to do is maintain a constant gap between the upper plate and the lower plate. So we're going to push up on that lower plate with a force F, much as we did with the Conan plate. Now, when we put push up, up with F, what we find is that the magnitude of F depends on both N1 and N2. Now, as a slight aside, a little rule of thumb to remember is that sometimes, not all the time, N2 is roughly minus one tenth of N1. The reason I mention it here is twofold. Firstly, it's a useful thing to know. Secondly, it gives you an idea of the fact that actually N2 is small compared to N1. And trying to resolve measurements of N2 in amongst N1 can be challenging. So the expression that you find if you do the analysis for normal stress in this geometry is you get a combination of N1 minus N2 being an expression here that's written on the board. And the way that expression is written may well be reminiscent of some of the expressions that we wrote when we analysed cone and plate rheometry before, only we were using torques at that point, not axial forces. So one thing we can do is do some cone and plate experiments, isolate N1, then do some parallel plate experiments, get a combination that involves N1 and N2, but knowing N1, then back out some data for N2. But in the real world, rheometers and any measurement device will have a noise floor, a sensitivity in effect, a certain minimum level of axial thrust that they can measure. They are also subject to a bit of noise. So you might find that N2 is either lost in that noise floor or is made inaccurate because of the presence of noise. So we need to be a little bit careful. So there's another trick that we can do with parallel plates to try and get access to quantifying N2, and that's to measure the pressure gradient in the radial direction on the bottom plate. The way that's done is to mount a pressure transducer in the bottom plate with the tip of the pressure transducer flush with that plate. Now that's really important. We'll discuss why in a second. But if you believe me for the time being that it is important to have these pressure transducers mounted flush, what we find is that this pressure measurement allows us to access N2 in isolation, which is quite a nice result. And what we find when you do the analysis is that the Z direction stress, ZZ, which is a kind of what we're measuring, can be isolated from the pressure because the two, those two quantities are interlinked. The pressure acting on that transducer is a result of the Z direction stress. And so what we find is that minus N2 is at the Z direction stress at the plate rim, less atmospheric pressure, which is a really neat result. But again, these measurements can be hard to take. N2 can be quite a small quantity. And the challenge here is discriminating the valid parts the valid data that represents N2 from noise. Now, let's just have a little note about transducers and why they had to be flush with the surface of that bottom plate. Now, let's imagine this transducer here in green is one I'm measuring the flow pressure with. Let's just say for the sake of simplicity, my flow is actually along 
in this direction here. So we've actually got kind of a slot flow or a pipe flow rather than the flow you're going to get in a rheometer. The reason I've done that is it's just easy to explain with flow like this than it is with a, an angular flow. If we imagine we're taking pressure measurements with this green transducer, it's going to be fine. Our concern here is what N1 does. And remember we said that N1 is effectively manifested as tension in streamlines. In this case, our streamlines are nice and straight and parallel. The tension in those streamlines is acting in a perpendicular direction to that pressure transducer. Hence, N1 won't affect that transducer. Lovely. Fine. However, imagine what you've done is left a fluid gap above that transducer, but below the line of the plate. If we think of the streamlines in this particular context, what we'll find is that close to where that gap is, the streamline is going to dip into that gap, a little bit like the way I've circled there. If we think of this in the context of normal stresses, our normal stresses act as a tension in those streamlines. And now those normal stresses and that tension in the streamlines is acting in a non-perpendicular direction to the way in which we're measuring the pressure. And so that streamline tension is going to affect our pressure readings, which means that we're going to get some combination of N1 and N2, where that combination depends on the fluid and the whole geometry, and we're not getting measurements of N2 alone. And remember that we said N2 is a lot smaller than N1, so any contribution to N1 is likely to dwarf the real measurements that we're trying to take of N2. So let's recap a few things here. We started off by saying that normal stress differences are material properties and they depend on gamma dot. A cone and plate device is a really good device in order to measure material properties. We saw this when we talked about measuring viscosity and we've just seen it again in talking about N1. The cone and plate device allows us to access N1 in isolation and it's simply twice the axial force over pi r squared, where big R here is the plate radius. We can make measurements in a parallel plate device as well, and we get a combination of N1 and N2, and if we already have N1 data, we may be able to isolate N2 from those readings. We also saw that if we've got pressure tappings installed flush to the lower plate surface, we can directly access N2. The caveat always being that N2 is small, Electrical noise exists, sensitivities exist, and for many fluids we may well not be able to get a device sensitive enough to get decent quality data.